If you recognize this iconic soundtrack, then you understand the greatness of Bully, one of Rockstar's best games, released right in the prime of gaming when Rockstar was just demolishing the market. In the three years before Bully's release, Rockstar released iconic game after game, including Red Dead Revolver, San Andreas, and The Warriors, among several others, but Bully was released as a punctuation, an exclamation point, if you will, at the end of this run of badass games, and it stands as probably the most unique and creative game that Rockstar has ever made. So today, let's hop back on the bus to Bullworth and see just what made Bully such a great game. That is not the Bullworth way, boy. Yeah, you could have fooled me. What? I said you could have fooled me. This place is full of bullies and maniacs. Nonsense. That's just school spirit. If you haven't played Bully, this video will have some spoilers of story events and twists and turns that happen in the game. So if you care at all, uh, here's a door. Bully, or Kenis Canem Edits, as it's called everywhere but the Americas, is Rockstar's open world game similar to their Grand Theft Auto franchise, often regarded as Grand Theft Auto but with kids, which is not something that I entirely agree with. There are a lot of similarities with the mission structure, the open world environments, and side jobs and activities, but the turn Grand Theft Auto with kids makes me think of something more related to Columbine rather than what Bully actually was. Instead of pistols and assault rifles, you get stink bombs and potato cannons. Instead of stealing cars and boats, you steal bikes and you ride your skateboard. And instead of hot coffee, you just get a little smooch in exchange for flowers. In reality, it's Rockstar's most tame and silly game, even though a lot of it is borrowed from games named after felonies. Bully puts you in control of a little heathen named Jimmy Hopkins after he's involuntarily enrolled at Bullworth Academy by his mother as she leaves the country on honeymoon with her new husband. Jimmy is new to the town of Bullworth and the school entirely. So he comes alone into a community of well-established cliques as an outsider, and while he wants to keep to himself, the kids all around him aren't quite so willing to let him do that. The game revolves around Jimmy winning the favor of each clique or faction if you will by doing side missions and side jobs very similar to Grand Theft Auto's mission and reputation structure. It truly had everything going for it. It took inspiration from plenty of past Rockstar titles with its gameplay and mission structures, especially games like The Warriors and San Andreas. Even some light stealth is thrown in there like Manhunt, except you're creeping around the shadows for panties instead of murder. The setting of Bullworth is fantastic. It's got the small on charm and it's not too large of a map to lose focus on the immersion of the game. The characters are all over the top and entertaining in typical Rockstar fashion, but I feel like they are particularly well written and acted in this game. The missions are iconic and the game truly has a heart of gold to it. So without further ado, let's dive into Bully. There's not much to explain. Just access the control rooms through the maintenance doors. Then do your thing. Cool. Moonwalk, oh, ooh, uh, yeah, oh, uh. There really is no denying the GTA mission structure of Bully, but as the saying goes, if it ain't broke, just keep your damn hands off it. Bullworth is an open world environment that Jimmy is able to explore and interact with how he pleases. Each chapter will open more and more areas of the town to explore as you progress through the story, and missions and side jobs are done by simply arriving to a glowing spot on the map or just speaking to the right person. There are main missions, side missions, side jobs, and mini games all throughout the map, with the main missions of course being the the only thing required to progress the story. As the game does take place at a school, there are classes to take every day, but these are considered mini games more than anything, and they function as short tasks to do that are slightly related to their subject matter. And upon completion, they grant some sort of bonus or perk, like art class giving you some moves with the ladies, or chemistry class giving you access to new weapons like firecrackers or itching powder. Speaking of which, combat is a big part of this game. You get throwable weapons like the itching powder and the firecrackers and several others, but you also get projectile weapons like slingshots and potato cannons, but the vast majority of combat is just hand-to-hand -hand fisticuffs, just straight up brawling. And it's actually done really well. Early on it's just punching and kicking away, but there are several opportunities to learn some new moves to beat some ass. You have gym class, which has you dressed out in your wrestling uniform, but instead of takedowns you learn how to headbutt, but more importantly you can learn 
learn some kick-ass moves from a homeless Korean war veteran that lives on campus in exchange for transistors that he needs to do whatever this is. Most missions involve some sort of hand-to-hand -hand combat, whether you're fending off bullies from attacking the nerds or you're beating up some dropouts in an abandoned building. It usually comes down to throwing hands. You can also use melee weapons found around the world like planks of wood or baseball bats as well if you're interested in some manslaughter charges on top of assault and battery. The items you get in your inventory are definitely some of the most memorable things about this game for me. They aren't only useful in combat, but are good for being just a general menace on campus. Tossing a stink bomb into a crowd to make people gag, making people run around like maniacs by throwing itching powder on them, tossing some marbles on the ground while people chase you around to make them slip and fall, egg a house, making sure to get it through some open windows, it's, it's all great and it brings back plenty of nostalgia, both to the game back in the day and also real life. Playing pranks with with stink bombs and egging houses is definitely something that I could relate to as a former heathen myself. Traversing the town of Bullworth can be achieved in a few different ways. You can run if you have to, but cool kids like to ride their skateboard. That's unlocked pretty early on in the story. And even cooler kids ride their bikes, especially if it's not theirs. However, you can buy different bikes and get upgraded stats for them by completing shop classes, and you can also get a cool little garage to store them all. You can also unlock a moped and a go-kart if manual labor isn't your ideal way to travel. But only kings know that skateboarding is the best using the wiggle trick. You can also fast travel to school using bus stops throughout the town, which I wish they implemented to work both ways to fast travel to different bus stops around the map, but it's convenient either way when trying to catch a class. Instead of stars as a wanted level, Jimmy has a trouble meter that fills up depending on what he's doing. There's different severity levels that warrant a different response from authority around town and on campus. Minimum severity violations include things like dress code or throwing an egg on the ground. It gets a little more serious when you move on to truancy or trespassing, and then even more severe with lockpicking or fighting, especially if you hit a girl, a young child, or an adult. And since most of this game revolves around being a general troublemaker, it's no surprise that a lot of your time is spent running from teachers on campus because you're being a pain in the ass. You can use some items like marbles or stink bombs to slow them down and get away, and eventually your trouble meter will decrease, unless you've maxed it out by being a very bad boy, and then when an adult grabs you, you are instantly busted, kind of like when a cop in GTA opens your car door. You have crossed the line, and that's the end of that. The gameplay of this game is definitely lighter in tone for Rockstar's catalog, but it's still 100% Rockstar and it feels like it, and there's no denying that it works really well either, especially in conjunction with the amazing world that this game has to offer. Bullworth is a fictional town that resembles the typical small town feel of the New England region of the United States. While the main attraction of the game is Bullworth Academy, there are several distinct sections of the town that are progressively unlocked throughout the game. Bullworth Town proper is the first area opened up after leaving the campus. It's the main area of the town, with shops, a movie theater, and a fire station, you know, all the good towny stuff. Old Bullworth Vale is the suburban area with mansions of the parents of the prep students and a beach with a pier and the carnival. New Coventry is the opposite. It's the rundown, low income side of town, more urban with junkyards and tenement housing. And then there's Blue Skies, the industrial area of town with factories and the town dock, and the lowest income housing being trailer parks. There's also a mental asylum here called Happy Volts that's considered part of this area. All these areas have their own charms and quirks about them, some being more utilized than others. The town proper is used nearly as much as the school, involving side missions and main missions alike, but areas like Blue Skies are really not capitalized on due to the low amount of missions in the area, as well as the fact that it's not unlocked until much later in the game. It's a really cool area though, but unfortunately you see very little of it. The whole town is great to explore. There really isn't much incentive other than the occasional easter egg or collectible rubber band, but the design into even the most hidden corners of the map is very much appreciated. I don't even notice until exploring the game very much later on that you can just find a random house, go into it, and get a bunch of tattoos all over your body, which I thought was really cool. Bullworth Academy is without a doubt the most detailed and well done part of the game though, and for good reason, the majority of the game takes place there. 
The campus of the academy has nine separate buildings, including dorm rooms for both male and female students, various different clique hangouts like the Harrington House or the Observatory, and the schooling buildings like the gym, the auto shop, and of course the main building. The main building resembles a college from Scotland, giving it some big European vibes with its neo-gothic design, and it looks nothing like the schools here in the US, at least public schools that I went to. But maybe that's because this is a private academy, but it's hard to believe that a school that looks this nice is regarded to as one of the toughest and worst schools in the country though, you know, uh, compared to this. I think my favorite thing about this game is the way that the school in town changes when seasons change. Each chapter brings along another time of year. You aren't in some timeless loop like some other open world games. Time actually moves forward based on mission progression. The first chapter is in the fall sometime when the curriculum begins, ending with a Halloween bash of sorts. Chapter 3 brings in snow and your mom even sends you a Christmas sweater, with the later chapters resembling spring and once the main missions end you play through what is called the endless summer, allowing you to freely explore the town. There's something just calming about the way that this game changes seasons. I love when games do this. It's a big part of why I love Stardew Valley as well. It's just like the same old areas and people and things to do, but the world is changing around you. Particularly chapter 3 in this game is just the best. Something about a small New England town in winter just speaks to me. The game in general just excels at portraying this small town feel in combination with a vaguely familiar school experience. There weren't definitive cliques at my school and I don't recall bullying actually being a thing that happened, but so much of Bullworth still feels familiar. Running late to classes, bringing a date to the carnival or movies, egging houses, racing bikes, plenty of things that just inhibit a sense of nostalgia. And I think that's why most people liked Bully, it just had this charm to it that's hard to describe. And if that charm didn't speak to you, then you probably just prefer Rockstar's other games over this one. Like Manhunt 2, you sociopath. Socio what? Sociopath, it means? Never mind. Forget I said anything. Another thing that seals the whole thing together is the excellent soundtrack this game had. From the main theme to the songs that accompany the different clicks, the sounds just seem perfectly suited to the game and again make you feel some sort of childlike charm when you hear them. All the tracks have a sort of funky bass line, a real upbeat feel to them, even the fight tracks feel happy at the same time that you're brawling with someone. It just speaks volume to the quality of the soundtrack when every track is well tailored to the situation or the environment that you're in. And again, changing with the seasons of the game. Sean Lee is the producer of the soundtrack and he's even done interviews out there saying that he's put in work on a soundtrack for Bully 2 even as far back as 2009, so maybe one day we'll see some more banger tracks from him and Bully. Bully is composed of several different factions in the game revolving around the idea of traditional cliques that you'd find in a school. The things that I like about the cliques is that they are extremely stereotypical of what you'd think they'd be, almost over the top in a way, which makes for entertaining and unique characters throughout the game. If you know a character is from a certain clique, then you know the general way that that character is going to act. Everything from where they hang out to their fighting style and weapons is all related to their clique. Each clique also has a leader of sorts that acts as a boss for each group that Jimmy must defeat or win the heart of over the course of the game to gain respect and friendship with each respective group. The nerds are led by Ernest Jones and they usually hang out at the observatory on campus or the comic shop in town. They usually wear the green school uniforms, they have bad posture, acne, glasses, they're all either overweight or underweight, they are the lowest clique in the hierarchy of Bullworth and they fight using slaps or shoves, but they often have the best weapons like stink bombs, bottle rockets, or spud guns to use as well. In stereotypical fashion, they are rivals with the jocks and the bullies. Thanks, Jimmy! Here's the cash! I'll tell my mom that not everyone at Bullworth is mean! <laughs> The bullies are led by Russell Northrup and are found everywhere on campus and in town, but they mostly hang out in the parking lot of the school or the motel in town. The bullies usually wear untucked white shirts and jeans and will without a doubt start a problem with Jimmy unless he's on good terms with them. They of course pick on the nerds all the time as well, using a brawling fighting style or baseball bats if it's getting real serious. You're dead, new kid! Dead! Hey, you're breaking up! 
The preps are led by Derby Harrington and are typically found at the Harrington House or the boxing gym in town. The preps are definitely the best dressed and groomed clique in the game. Wearing their aqua berry vests and sweaters, the preps are the stereotypical rich kids and are snobby and pompous and oh so fun to kick the shit out of as Jimmy. They fight in a traditional boxing manner with a lot of blocking, dodging, and counterattacks and are a little more tough when fighting them as Jimmy. And if they use any weapons, it's usually just eggs. And the only people they beef with is the greasers. You are an idiot, Hopkins. I've got a photograph. You know what you can do with that, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> The greasers, led by Johnny Vincent, can be found at the auto shop or in the gas station in town. They dress in leather jackets with their hair slicked back and they harken back on the 1950s stereotype. They are more of a later game clique and they keep to themselves unless you start something with them, and they fight using a martial arts style and are quick to pick up wood planks or use a slingshot to take you out. And they only have a problem with the spoiled rich kids in the game, unless you get with Johnny's girl that is. Here are the pictures, Johnny. Lola's a bit of a slut, it seems. I knew it! I just knew it! The Jocks are the last clique on the school's campus, led by Damon West, and are usually found on the football field or in the gym. They wear letterman jackets, jerseys, and other athletic style clothes, and they fight using tackles and wrestling, and are by far the hardest clique to fight with. If they have them available, they'll also use baseball bats to do a lot of damage. They often attack Jimmy due to his early reputation with the nerds, and aren't confronted until late in the game. Oh, I'm sorry, Psycho. Did oh. I hit your boyfriend? Yes, yeah, Psycho. You gonna try to kick our asses now? There's also one more clique called the Townies, a group of dropout kids that are located in Blue Skies, led by Edgar Munson. And they're usually dressed in some kind of orange color and have a punk or heavy metal influence to their style. They never show up on campus, save for one distinct mission, and are quick to cause problems with Jimmy if he's on their turf. They have a tough street fighting style and will throw bricks and firecrackers as well, and they're usually much bigger than the other students, save maybe for the jocks, probably because they're a few years older than the kids at the school. <sighs> Alright, one question. How are we gonna stop a load of kids from beating the crap out of each other? It's America! We go in there with threats and bribes until we get what we want. If all else fails, we beat the crap out of everyone. That's why I brought along backup. Russell likes to hurt people for peace. Cool. Then it's a plan. Other than these cliques, there are a handful of kids not affiliated with anyone. The majority of the kids in the main building fall into this category, but the most prominent are the main characters of the game. Jimmy himself, Gary, and Petey all do not affiliate with any one group. Of course, there are other characters in the game other than kids as well. There's faculty to the school that are some of the main cast, from the principal of the school, Dr. Krabblesnitch, to his personal secretary, Miss Danvers, to Edna, the lunch lady, and, and Mr. Burton, the creepy gym teacher. Like the cliques of the school, each staff member falls into stereotypes of their position in the school. Dr. Krabblesnitch is stern and pompous and believes that he knows what's right, even though he's usually not. Edna is a vile old lady that coughs, sneezes, and spits in the cafeteria food, mostly intentionally. The biology teacher Dr. Slaughter is creepy and obsessed with death and morbidity. The English teacher Mr. Galloway likes to drink scotch a little bit too much. And Mr. Burton the gym teacher is a washed up ex-high school athlete that peaked in high school, blaming his status on an injured knee. He's also a massive creep that caused Zoe to drop out of the school due to his sexual harassment. These characters are all larger than life and well written and they make the story that much more enjoyable. And then, of course, there's the main cast of Misfits. Sir. Great! So go and collect all the dirty laundry from the, uh, girl's dorm. Okay. And if you get caught, I know nothing about it. I won't say anything, sir. In fact, I'll make it clear that I never saw you coming out of an adult store clutching illicit magazines. Good boy! Now hurry up and bring them to me by the school gates, but... Shh. Jimmy is a surprisingly deep character. The game opens really well and it lays out the foundation with Jimmy. He's being a dick, for lack of better terms, with his mom over her marriage to her new husband. Seeming like a terrible child to have, pairing that with the fact that he's being boarded at the school while his mom flees the country on honeymoon, you think you just have this pain in the ass kid to play as for this whole game. But as soon as he leaves the car, his introspection on the state of things tells a little bit different of a story.
Mom, why'd you marry that phony? What is wrong with you? Oh, I can't believe this. Jimmy has a rough exterior and he bites as much as he barks, but in reality, he's just a troubled kid. We don't ever see the full scope of Jimmy's relationship with his parents or any clips of his home life or prior schooling, but this brief opener definitely tells a deeper story than I originally thought 16 years ago. Parallels can also be made of Jimmy and Holden from the book The Catcher in the Rye, as they both have a history of difficult home lives and being thrown out of multiple schools. Jimmy even uses the term phony when talking about his stepdad and one of Holden's favorite words. He arrives at his school a loner and is quick to make more enemies than friends, but that is sort of the basis of the game. He spends time winning the hearts of each clique, slowly growing in popularity until he pretty much runs the school. He also wins the favor of several staff members, town folk, and various girls or boys on campus. This reputation seems really good on a surface level, but it quickly becomes redundant at a certain point in the story. Because no matter how many favors or side quests you've done for different people or groups, the whole school hates you at one scripted plot point. But it's still a lot of fun playing as a generally neutral, take no shit character that has a real problem with bullies and assholes. You are blind, old man, blind! And you are leaving! I tried to contact your mother, but she's still off on a cruise. Until I hear from her, I will have to let you stay here in your room. But you may not wear the school uniform uh, or attend classes. Gotta be kidding you are me. leaving the academy to attend to your education elsewhere. Now get out! Whatever, man. Jimmy isn't a degenerate, he's just a bad teenager from a tough home. And like most kids his age, he doesn't know how to process shit yet. I think Jimmy is incredibly unhappy at Bullworth, but he has a great heart and he takes the time and effort to stand up to injustice. And is exactly why I don't support the idea or the rumor out there that Jimmy is somehow the teenage version of James Earl Cash from Manhunt. He's a good kid deep down. Another standout character is the antagonist, Gary. Gary is the one who would grow up to be James Earl Cash. He's a legitimate sociopath. Even Algy thinks so. Just that you're friends with that sociopath Gary. He starts off being one of the first people to talk to Jimmy, feigning friendship with him, but all along he's using Jimmy as nothing more than a pawn to win the favor of the school for himself. However, he isn't as likable or as friendly as Jimmy is. I mean, the dude dressed up as a Nazi officer for Halloween. He has clear intentions to run the school, and in his mind he's destined to be everyone's favorite person. Textbook narcissist asshole. He even ties up the dean at one point, thinking that it'll somehow work out and he can frame Jimmy for the whole thing, and that ties into the whole school hating Jimmy for a brief point as well. Gary somehow convinced them all to hate Jimmy, which is a point that I found really dumb. Jimmy has been doing favors and being friendly with everyone for months at this point, and all it takes is Gary, some creepy sociopath that no one even likes, to whisper in their ear and they all of a sudden hate Jimmy. A little far-fetched, but it goes with the climax of the game, I suppose. You did all my dirty work for me, Hopkins. You're like a puppet, only dumber. Whatever, let's finish this. The last of the main characters is Pete, the little sweetheart of Bullworth. Pete is shy and he's quiet and he lets both Gary and Jimmy take advantage of him and be rude to him. But over time he starts to grow on Jimmy and Jimmy starts to consider him one of his only real friends. He's like the only level headed person in the game as well. He seems much more mature than your average 15 year old and he is vital in Jimmy getting the motivation to take Gary down after he gets him expelled. Pete is the homie from beginning to end. Oh, that would never work. You gotta show him who's boss. You might be on to something. See you later. Hey, wait, Jimmy. Can I come for once? But really, this game is filled with countless characters with so much charm and charisma to them, it's hard to not just talk relentlessly about everyone. Russell, Algy, Zoe, Johnny, Korean War Vet, Edna, Mr. Burton are all such larger than life characters in the game. I don't want to do the typical plot summary of the game like I usually do on some retrospectives, but I do want to take some time to talk about the mission structure of the game. This game definitely follows the Rockstar open world formula, which for the most part is great. But over time you start to realize Rockstar isn't that great at making good missions. Don't get me wrong, there are some memorable and iconic missions from plenty of Rockstar games. Look, I know we all got yelled at a bunch to just follow the fucking train CJ. All we had to do was follow the damn train CJ! But that's 
That's because of Big Smoke, the well-written character that's yelling at CJ. That's what Rockstar excels at, well-written characters and crafted open worlds. The actual missions are never really something to write home about unless they offer some sort of big set piece, which they often do, so it's all good. Nicky Jakey talks about this a good bit in his Red Dead 2 video, and if you aren't one of the 9.6 million views on that video, go give it a watch and tell them Mr. Hammer sent you. But to my point, Bully is no different than every other Rockstar game. Each chapter of the game has storyline missions and non-storyline missions to complete, as well as an assortment of side tasks or errands to do, like going to class or delivering a package to someone. There's also several other activities to do like bike races or go-kart races as well. But the main missions are still even structured like something a side objective might be. Hell, a lot of the missions are just glorified tutorials, but they'll have well-acted cutscenes, character involvements, and of course some kind of memorable set piece. Take the mission Slingshot, a glorified tutorial on how to use the slingshot. Gary leads Jimmy to the parking lot of the school where they find this abandoned school bus with nice breakable windows to practice your shot on. Gary being Gary decides that that's not exciting enough so he takes you to the football field where the team is practicing and he has you climb a tree to take out several jocks on the field while he sits on a bench and he watches. Jimmy knocks out the players one by one while the coach yells at them for being lazy. It's a neat game and a memorable mission, but at the end of the day, you are simply learning the mechanics of the slingshot. You're learning how to aim it at windows and then you get some moving targets to hit. A lot of the missions follow this trend. One of my favorite missions is the Halloween Bash in Chapter 1. It's just a glorified guide on how to use the various different weapons that you have, like itching powder and stink bombs. But again, it's presented in such a fantastic way that it's still probably my favorite mission. The Panty Raid mission, which by the way is one of the creepy missions in the game. Not only are you digging through the girls dorm for panties, but it's the football coach who gives you this objective and he asks for the dirty laundry himself right after Jimmy catches him coming out of an adult store. But it is one of the few times that you use stealth in the game. You use it one other time as well, also in the girls dorm, but it's only these two missions that stealth is even an option. But this isn't a bad thing. These missions are some of the best in the game and they leave a lasting impression. If not for the iconic moments in them, then the shock value that they may have. Just like the characters, I can go on and on about the fantastic missions. Funhouse Fun puts you with the nerds in control of the fun house at the carnival, where you use animatronics and props to beat up on the jocks that chased you in there. Complete Mayhem is the climax of the game and has you rescuing Russell from the police and going from click leader to leader and beating them up in this one giant brawl at the school. Cook's Crush has you running around the town helping Edna get ready for her big date coming up. There's a mission where you run around the school to dispose of Mr. Galloway's scotch bottles so he doesn't get fired for drinking on the job, and many, many more. There's just a great time every time with the missions, and they just don't miss. My God, corn! I didn't have corn for dinner! Oh, this is awful! Oh, 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 yeah. God damn, I stink! I'm gonna have to shower for days with bleach! Ah, this is worse than when I got hazed! The thing that separates Bully from every other Rockstar open world game is that there's a sense of time. As I stated earlier, the seasons change with completion of the chapters in the game, but each day also has a time limit to it. Jimmy must go to bed and wake up every day, so you can't just run around indefinitely like CJ in San Andreas. In fact, if you try to stay up too late, you just pass out in the street. This invokes a sort of time management system in the game, because as you are a student, you have two classes a day to attend to, and they happen to have set times in the day. And if you want to do some other stuff like side objectives or even story missions, you will inevitably be skipping class to do so, which leads to truancy and then authority on your butt. So each day you kind of need to decide which type of day you're going to have. Are you going to do classes and then have a few small side objectives or are you going to hop off campus and race go-karts all day? This is a neat thing that I think a lot of people overlook about this game when comparing it to other open world games of the sort. It's not as strict as, say, Stardew Valley, but it is something worth shouting out. Without a doubt, Bully has left a lasting impression. This game is an ode to all those who were bullied, 
and while I personally never was, nor was I a bully myself, there are countless people out there who loved taking charge of Jimmy and getting their own revenge on bullies and cliques that did them wrong. And it's an added benefit that Jimmy isn't a bully himself, he just doesn't take shit from anyone either. And he steps in when he sees that there's an injustice in the world. Across the board, Bully was praised left and right at release, yet another banger from Rockstar to add to the books. As of 2008, the PS2 copy alone sold more than 1.5 million copies, which is quite a large amount, but in Rockstar's growing eyes, it really wasn't. Compare that to GTA 3 who has sold about 15 million copies, or San Andreas with its 20 plus million copies. Even though this game was a renowned success in every sense of the term, it was a dud in Rockstar's or specifically Take Two's eyes, and inevitably it was treated as such. Bully Scholarship Edition, a remaster of sorts, was released in 2008 for the Wii, 360, and PC, and it added some new missions, new classes, new characters, and some new items and clothing and stuff and again it scored pretty favorably, except on the PC it was just a buggy mess, and it still is actually. And this leads us to the infamous Bully 2, something that has been rumored in development since 2009. And still to this day I see rumors everywhere now and then about the game being in development. There's no denying that the game was once in development, with former Rockstar employees and freelancers alike that worked on the game saying so, but I think that the odds that this game is ever made today is slim to none. Just like Manhunt 3, the rumored Warrior sequel, or countless other games that Rockstar has deemed unworthy. Bully, unfortunately, falls into that trend of never getting made. Just like any good Rockstar game, Bully has its fair share of controversy. Not quite manhunt levels of infamy, but some attention here and there. The title itself stirred some problems just because of the subject matter and the developers that are making the game and their past game topics. There were plenty of teacher and parent organizations out there with panties firmly bunched just over the name of the game before anything else. The game was banned in Brazil due to findings of the State Psychology Society that the game could have negative and harmful effects on the minds of teenagers. In 2016, they realized that was a crock of shit and they released the game anyways. British Labour MP Keith Vaz tried to get Bully banned in the UK, or get it rated for ages 18 and up at least, as well as two British retailers, Curry's and PC World, refusing to stock the game because it didn't fit with their family friendly image. And we see that lasted a good long while. And good old Jack Thompson, the same guy who tried to ban Manhunt and Grand Theft Auto both, also took the stab at getting Bully off the shelves in Florida, calling it a Columbine simulator. Clearly he didn't see the first part of the video where I state that it's exactly not that. Stink bombs and firecrackers don't quite equal MAC-10s and shotguns, Jack. After the judge turned down his appeal, saying that the game was dope as hell as he pre-ordered his own copy, Jack went on a tirade and accused the judge of being responsible for future kids' skull fractures. I injuries from slingshots and beatings from baseball bats. This guy is just a lunatic, really. This is also the same guy that tried to sue Facebook for $40 million, saying that the website caused him great harm and distress by not removing angry memes directed at him. What a clown Jack Thompson is. Uh, don't sue me, loser. When it comes to Rockstar's fantastic catalog, Bully has to be in everyone's top 5 games. It's just such a unique and creative turn on the genre, and it offered some genuinely lighthearted fun from a AAA game that has the gameplay and mission structure of some of the greatest open world games of our time. There's no denying Bully is great, and I don't feel like editing a 4 hour long video, so I trimmed this script a good bit. Please let me know your favorite part of the game that made this game so special to you, especially if it's something that I didn't touch on here in this video because there's no way I could have covered everything. I'd like to take a moment to thank my patrons for holding it down. Old Geriatric Schwinn, Doug Smith, Anonymous Starkweather, Sofa Palace Productions, Zachary Parkerson, and Kid Kingpin. Thank you so much for your support, and thank you to everyone in the Discord holding it down with memes. Hop in there and chat if you'd like to, and as always, thank you for watching. I hope to see you next time. Peace. Thank you everyone. Good night.